So, uh, it's been a while since the last West Coast Toast and Roast, and the truth is we recorded an episode about a month ago when we usually would, but the software we used crashed, so we lost the whole thing, and that's a shame, because I think that was maybe the best episode we ever did. We talked about Smiling Friends, we talked about the Nintendo Direct that month. Yeah, I did a backflip. Um, yeah, a robber crashed into my apartment, and I used my kung fu to beat him up, and you could have heard the whole thing, but the Steven audience Steven Spielberg lost. showed up. Yeah, yeah, Steven Spielberg showed up. Uh, two of us guess. kissed. Two of us kissed. I'm not going to say which ones. It's going to be a mystery. Yeah, that's a one for the viewers at home to figure out. Yeah, yeah. What else happened, Will? Uh, let's see. Um, I had to cut off both my legs uh, due to increasing hypothermia, and that was kind of sad. You um, made a really weird choice to record from uh, the Antarctic. Yeah, but hey, on the bright side, I did find the cure for diabetes there, so now Dav is completely good. Yep. Yeah. I'm all good now. I'm cured. Yeah. Rev up those fryers and fill those champagne glasses to the tippy top. It's West Coast Toast and Roast with Tommy, Will, and Dav. Welcome back to West Coast Toast and Roast. I am recording via two different mediums of audio uh, software to prevent such a mistake again, Tommy. And I am only doing it from one because uh, I've got it on my computer and I'm Will. And I'm Dev and I don't have diabetes anymore. I'm cured. Yeah. Well, boys, we did. Diabetes is no. <laughs> Someone's gonna like hear this and believe it and be like, I gotta rush out and get this diabetes cure. Yeah. Um yeah. Elephant in the room, or perhaps large red panda in the room, we all watched Turning Red. Do we feel like starting there? No. <laughs> well, no, we it's can. been fun, folks. Uh see you next time. Um <laughs> uh, you know, uh Turning Red is the new Pixar film. I really loved it. Um you know, a lot of discourse around this one because uh, people got <laughs> really mad about it. Um, where do you guys? Yeah, I mean, I, I personally, I didn't, I wasn't in love with the animation style, um, but I feel like that was like my biggest problem with it at the beginning. That and the kids looked annoying, but you know, <laughs> which kids aren't? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you uh, you said it looked like uh, the Grubhub commercial everybody memes on. Oh, yeah, and I, I still stand by that. Um, <laughs> someone pointed it out on Twitter. They're like, someone was like, why does everyone have a problem with this? And someone was just like, because it looks like the Grubhub commercial and can't really unsee it. Which, okay, Dev, be the tiebreaker, because Will and I were bickering about this. I said that if Linguini from Ratatouille were in Turning Red, he would not look incongruous. Do you agree? Uh... No, honestly, I think he would stand out quite a bit. Yeah, see? I don't know, I don't know. Which, I think he's he's got a big old bean nose. He's beanier than the rest of them. No, but he, like, the the characters in Turning Red are very soft. Um, he's pretty like, soft. No, he's got, like, he's his nose is super angular. No, it, it's, the, it's round as a bean. It's the opposite of angular. Well, it's angular in comparison to, like, the characters in Turning Red that don't have, like, like they've got the big mouths. Um, and like the kind of, I hey, guess, hey, like, hey, you don't have to like turning red's art style, but you do not have to compare it to that Netflix cartoon. Ah, uh, ha ha ha. That's that's really funny. It is. I'm funny. Yeah, I guess I'm I can't funny. really explain. I just it, it seems like putting. I mean, I guess in 2D terms, it's like putting um. A character from. Like Disney into a into a Studio Ghibli movie, like they're both animated, but they don't quite have the same uh, proportions. I don't know. Well, um, I guess all that aside, I thought this movie was very. You said the children were annoying, and I agree with you. But they were annoying in a way I felt was very authentic. Just you know, uh, as someone who was a, has been a teacher for a while now, I've taught all those kids. And I just think the dialogue was. Um, you know, I, like, obviously it's a little cringe, but they're supposed to be pretty lame, because children are lame and annoying. And I was very endeared to them by the end of this movie. I, uh, I love, I love the one who just, uh, Abby, she just yells all the time, and I have a dozen kids like that. I don't know, just the hyper-aggression is an untapped character archetype, I feel. 
Uh, Priya does vampire hands when she's mad. She's lame as shit, and I love it. I don't quite... It, it kind of sounds like you're like, yeah, the, these characters are fucking, fucking annoying. I love them, but to each his own. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, though? It's like... No, were, I do. I'm just... I'm... I'm messing. I, I think it does protecting. do a good job of capturing, like, what girls were like in the early 2000s, to be honest. Yeah, I, I'd love it as a period piece that way. I think 2002 Canada is... Oddly specific, like, I don't think anyone was begging for that movie to happen, but I think it's a very endearing set piece, and I really like the music in it that it lends itself to. Yeah, yeah like, there's a, like, Backstreet Boys-esque band. Yeah. Although this was 2004, so I feel That's... like Backstreet Boys were mid-90s, or were they still popular? In... It's 2002. Um, I feel like that's a... Uh... That's a good enough pinpoint for the boy band craze. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, I guess some of the... I, they could have punched up the dialogue a bit. They, maybe... And I was five in 2002. Maybe I just don't remember. They throw around epic a lot, which I think is much more like 2011 kid thing. Am I right? I, I do feel that, yeah. 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 And again, I was five at that, but I do feel like just a couple modern sensibilities leak through the cracks a little. Um, well, I had a feeling I, you love an authoritarian, stern mom figure <laughs> that came out. <laughs> no, the, the, you the like a fascist, don't you? Awesome. <laughs> you love, but Will does like the art, you like the archetype of a uh, uh, perhaps stern but well meaning mother figure. Do you, is that correct, Will? Uh, I get, I, I guess, yeah. You want me to phrase it as you like old ladies? Do you want that on the internet? No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> no, and like that grandma was like characters, and I, I thought both the grandma and the mom were very well developed characters. Yeah, they felt very real. Totally. Yeah. Um, gosh. Uh, yeah, and it's cool that they like. There's a Pixar movie that's perfectly PG. And, you know, this, uh, why? this one kind of pushed the envelope. No, I'm saying it's still rated PG, but it goes into themes that you just really haven't seen a kid's movie do before. And I think it's good for both young girls and boys to see it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will say, I think I was sitting at an eight, thoroughly enjoying it. I'm not going to spoil the third act, but that's what bumped it up to a nine. It takes a hard, hard swerve to one of my favorite genres. <laughs> that I didn't see coming, and I was just grinning ear to ear, and that's when this fix got to sit among my favorite Pixar movies, personally. I do think it gets better as it goes on. Yeah. yeah. It's a little long. There's some fat in the middle they could have cut. Yeah, I agree. Um, although, I, it's, it's like, it's got a one hour, 45 minute runtime on Disney+, Plus, but most of it is like, or not most of it, but like a good... Like twenty minutes of it is credits. That, that's say. kind of a, a common thing for Disney Plus anymore. I've just noticed that a lot, where they have tons of credits after everything. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder. All right. I think I I think they probably pushed this just to Disney Plus because apparently, uh, and I don't know if this was before or after, but I did hear that Encanto bombed at the box office but did really well on Disney Plus. I think that and Omicron <laughs> kind of did it in. Oh yeah, that's uh, so in, that's also something that I forgot happened. Is it like mandated that all Pixar is straight to Disney Plus now? No, because Lightyear's coming out. Huh. All right, and that movie looks fucking awesome. I would have loved yeah. to seen have seen that third act on a big screen. I thought that would have been cool. Yeah, again, I I think a lot of it is um is just like I think some of it is inner workings because like. To be fair, Omicron, but also, like, movies are still doing relatively well at the box office. So I think there was probably something else that was a factor. They're doing well if, and I, I, they're doing well if there's three Spider-Men. Well, I mean, the Batman is doing super well. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. And it doesn't, well, it doesn't help, it doesn't hurt that the HBO same-day deal is, because I think Su the Suicide Squad bombed because people were like, well, I'm just going to watch this at home. Without buying a ticket. 
Yeah, I know. I think it was like the fourth most popular HBO Max movie of the year. Yeah, something about Mortal Kombat got people into those seats, which I don't get because that movie fucking sucked. Yeah, I mean, brand recognition sells. Yeah, I guess so. Well, in conclusion, I, I, I've got major shiny new penny for this syndrome for this one. Uh, speaking of syndrome, Incredibles, Pixar, yeah. This could be my new favorite Pixar. I'd have to revisit some of my other favorites to see. I recently rewatched Monsters, Inc., and I love that movie. I might like the Turning Red more than that one. Maybe. Really? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, nothing's going to beat The Incredibles for me. I, I think that's a... Same here. I, I think that's not only a perfect animated film, it's just kind of a perfect film in general. That's what makes me hesitant, because yeah. I, like, all, like I said, Shiny New Penny... I'm in more of a turning red mood at the moment. Every time I watch The Incredibles, I notice something I didn't last time. So I think that one would pretty firmly uh, still establish itself. Well, I think it's not just Shiny New Penny. It's that you literally watched it like, what, an hour ago? Well, that's what Shiny New Penny is. Yeah, no, but it's not just like, usually Shiny New Penny is like within a, within like a week, oh, but it's, it's so fresh. Yeah, yeah exactly. we wa- watched it today. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Maybe I'll wake up tomorrow and be like, eh, 6 out of 10. All right, well, Will, would you like to uh, start us off on our usual rotation? Yes, and I guess speaking of which, I'm going to toast the Batman. Um, I was uh, a little cautious about this movie because I think um, for all like it's well intentioned or not well intentioned it's well done filmmaking i think the bale f- films do have a lot of stuff i don't like so i was like oh this is just going to be you know bale 2.0 and it absolutely wasn't um robert pattinson makes a really really good young batman um the the stuff they do with the riddler is really cool um the, the Penguin, this fucking Italian-American dude, is awesome. And he's getting his own HBO Max series. Um, but more to the point, I feel like especially... Like, as everyone for, from the Dark Knight movies, everyone remembers Joker. Like, that was the highlight of that movie, is the Joker. I get that. But in this movie, I feel like this was the first live-action Batman to actually get the character. Because there's a bit at the end... Where, and I'm not going to spoil it, because um, I know you haven't seen it, right, Sharon? Yeah, I gotta see it. I'm going to see it tomorrow. Yeah. Um, there's just a bit at the end. I guess not a bit. It's like near, kind of like maybe the last 10, 20 minutes, where they do something with the character that makes me think, okay, he's not just, you know, a ball of angry angst. He's, <clears throat> he's more than that. And I think that's really something that no Batman movie has ever done. I know a lot of people who love the Christian Bale movies. I don't know anyone who says distinctly Christian Bale is my favorite Batman. So you feel this is the counter to that. Yeah, like, I think the Bale movies work really well as movies. But this works well as a Batman story. I see. Um, do you feel it earns all three hours? Uh, I, I, some of it does drag, which is why for me it's, uh, it's not a perfect movie, but I was pretty thoroughly invested in the whole thing. You know, I had a seat relatively close to the front because it was so packed, but I, I didn't feel bad. I was, I was watching it. I was enjoying it the whole time. Yeah, that was my complaint was that it's just, it's way too long and it really does not need to be as long as it is. Yeah, I think they could have cut a lot of, um... I guess, like, the the middle stuff between, like, all the crazy shit with the Riddler. Um, like, not the Penguin stuff, but some of it could have... Um, some of it could have taken a backseat. In the yeah. Batmobile. But um, I do think that, that, like, first ten minutes or so is just perfect. It's just awesome. Hmm. Yeah, what are... Because I, I know you really enjoyed it, too, Davey. What are your thoughts on it? Um... I mean, it's just really good overall, like, very well made. Um, the the action when it did happen was pretty great. It, it wasn't really like an action focused movie. And I do appreciate that because the like the actual mystery of it was pretty good, too. Yeah, I, I think it's awesome that it's like how the Bale movies are 
well, action thrillers, this is a murder mystery. Mm. Yeah. It does a it does a pretty good job at that. Uh, but again, just the, the length goes on a little bit longer than I would like. Uh, there's a few characters that are kind of thrown in there, and they really don't need to be there at all. Um, like which one's for you? Um, the main one I'm thinking of is like, and and I, I know like she's important to the story technically, but she probably doesn't like they probably could have written a different way of doing this. But uh, that lady that um, Catwoman lives with. Oh yeah, that was a bit of um. I guess the deal with that is that they tried to set it up that um like this is Catwoman's motivation but in a movie that's so heavily Batman focused it did kind of steer off course yeah it's just she she was absolutely a plot device I mean she they kind of build her up like she's going to be more important than she is and they don't really go anywhere with that so that's just kind of one example I think of where you know maybe if if they reworked this somehow in the script it, it probably could have shortened the runtime a bit um, so, and, okay, uh, this is my train of thought, sorry, Will, you mentioned it's more of a murder mystery, when we're talking, uh, I saw some bits in the trailer that were, like, Penguin and Batman having a car chase, is that not quite what it appears, would you say that's a respite that's a little more exciting? Uh, it's more, I guess it's more of a genre break, because they do have a car chase, and it is really cool, mm -hmm. Um, but the meat and potatoes of it is a murder mystery. It's, you know, why the fuck is Riddler doing this? Okay. Yeah, uh... Um... Sorry, you guys... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, yeah, Colin Farrell as the Penguin really excites me, so, um... He's gonna get... Yeah, he's a ton of fun. He's getting an HBO he's show great. to himself. Yeah? What were you about to say? Sorry. Uh, I was just gonna say, um... Like, some of the... A big thing is, when I saw the reviews for this, every critic was like, this is the most miserable movie I've ever seen. This is no fun. This is, like... This is torture to watch. 10 out of 10. <laughs> and I feel like that's kind of, like, disingenuous because it's, it is a lot of fun. It's, the mystery is really thrilling. The Penguin's a lot of fun. The action is good. Um, it's just... It's, it's interesting how, like, looking looking at that criticism and i was almost like okay well i don't want to see this and then i saw it and really enjoyed it um it's uh i don't know it just it just struck me as odd that that was like not just one critic but every critic was like this is the most miserable dark movie i've ever seen and i didn't have a single moment of fun in it i think i don't really agree with that I think cool. yeah i mean sorry it, I, I was just because it's dark and it's gritty, but it's still, you know, fun. I don't see why people are like, there is no, there is no joy in this film. Well, it's like they've never seen a noir movie before. It's like, that's what it's supposed to be. It's dark. It's dreary. I'm willing to wager. It's not really supposed to be sunshiny. I'm willing to bet that um, people writing publications like that are over eager to compensate for... <laughs> Uh, the expectations of a superhero film um you know like, yeah i guess they're you know mo it's not a marvel movie there are no witty quips yeah yeah which yeah I, and that's, it's a breath of fresh air <laughs> yeah no one no one wants to poop all over marvel more than i do but like even um even removing that from the perspective i wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if somebody's approach was to be like we need to make it clear this is not the explosions of Batman that you might come in expecting. This is very much the world's greatest detective at work, at least ostensibly from what I've gathered. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it tomorrow. I, I had to carve out a day where I could fucking take a, uh, take a five-hour respite to take the bus <gasps> over to theater watch a three-hour film with previews and go back but um yeah, i'm hoping to knock that out tomorrow i think it'll be cool yeah you'll have to let us know how it is because i enjoyed it a lot yeah. one more thing though that i wanted to get maybe your opinion on will um towards the end and i'm not again i'm not going to go into spoilers and just without spoiling it uh there's a guest what what's your opinion on that 
A guest? Uh, yeah, like a somebody who shows up, but you don't really see them. Oh, um, not in love with it. Me neither. That that Be- felt a little weird. Yeah, because um, it's Nick Fury. Isn't that it? he's just like, what do you know about the Justice League project? <laughs> um, no, I without spoiling it. It seems like they're just retreading what previous, like, films and adaptations in, not even, like, of all time, but in, like, recent years are doing. So I don't think they're going to do anything new with it. I think they should just, you know, I I think they should forget about that character, unfortunately. Fair enough. Um. Now, David, let me ask you this. Since it's really realistic, who would you like to see as the villain of the sequel? Because Robert Pattinson is like, I want it to be the Court of Owls. Uh, to, I mean, to be honest, I don't know too much about uh, Batman's rogue gallery, but I guess it would be neat to see, like, Mr. Freeze or something. Oh, yeah. Especially if it was played by Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> again. <laughs> That'd be Jokes great. aside, I have a hard time picturing how they'd adapt Mr. Freeze to that setting. Uh, I could honestly see them doing something cool with it. Just, like, really into dry ice? I guess. <laughs> um, he's kind of become a Batman rogue in recent memories, but I think the, it would be really cool if the sequel finally, and I'm a bit biased because this is my favorite fictional character of all time, but it would be really cool if the sequel brought in Deathstroke because he's never had a live-action adaptation. And I think that would be cool if they did it like, you know, he serves his country, he comes back and he's hated, so he can't really do anything else, so he has to go back into that cycle of violence as a, against, you know, a person who's had everything and, you know, it's a, it would be a cool clash. Would you still want uh, Flash Thompson to play him? Uh, I wouldn't want any... Well, I think it should be its own universe, so I'd say no. But they've got to get a pretty good actor. Do you have someone in mind? Um, John not Cena. At the, <laughs> would you say John Cena to have? Yeah. Yeah, you know. Um, first he's Peacemaker, then he's Deathstroke. Uh, no, not really. That surprised me a bit, man. All right. Yeah, I guess I haven't, because it's like a character that I, that I have a picture of in my mind so much, so... I get, right now, I'm only thinking of like this, what he looks like in the comics. Maybe Mark Wallman could be a cool Deathstroke. Oh, yeah. How about Tom Holland? <laughs> Shoots a guy. Oh, sorry. Oh, jeez, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Mr. Batman, sir. I, uh... <laughs> Alfred Pennyworth. What kind of name is that? Well, either way, I enjoyed it a lot, and uh, I'm going to pass it over to Dav. Cool. Um, I'm going to be real with you. I don't really have anything to roast uh, this session, um, at least nothing that I've watched. Uh, so I'm just going to throw out, since we're on the topic of the Batman, I'm going to go ahead and roast those fucking kids who were sitting in the same row as me in the movie theater last <laughs> night. Because, okay, listen, here's what happened. All right, here's the tea. So... I'm sitting in the farthest back row of the theater, right? Because uh, it gives me a pretty good view. Nice isolated seat. Mm-hmm. Um, there's uh, this uh, like middle-aged couple sitting next to me. And then right on the other side of them, there's this group of like five, probably like early high school, late middle school age kids. And right off the bat, they are... <laughs> right off the bat. Anyway, right off the bat, um, as we're watching The Batman, and we're like getting into it, they are just chatting away. They're being relatively quiet. You know, I can tune them out a bit. But they're chatting and chatting. And then suddenly, I just see this fucking flash. I look over. These kids are taking goddamn pictures with their flash on of the movie theater for some reason. What the fuck? And I, I look down at the front, and there's like an usher standing there. And he's like kind of looking away. Like, that's not my problem right now. I'm like, okay. I'm just going to assume that was like an accident. And uh, we're just going to move on. 
And so, uh, like, a, maybe the 45 minutes goes by, and this is what I hear. Hello? No. Uh, oh, Jesus. No, I told him I was going to be at the movies. <laughs> and his friends are, like, next to him, like, shh, shh, shh. And he stops for a bit. Like, five seconds. No, I said I'm at the movie theater. I'm at the cinema. <laughs> His friends again are like telling him to shut the fuck up. He's like, shh. They're about like 10 seconds goes by. All right, love you, bye. <laughs> and <laughs> and I, I look over and <laughs> the fucking, the middle-aged guy who's sitting next to me is looking over at them. Like looking pissed out of his mind. <laughs> but we're just like, okay, we're just going to pretend that didn't happen. We're going to move on. We're going to keep watching the Batman because it's a good ass movie and I can get sucked into it. I can just ignore this shit, tune everything out. So about 30 minutes goes by and I see another fucking flash. Another flash. And I look over at them and I'm like, they cannot seriously be doing this right now. And as I'm looking over at them, two more fucking flashes. That's just miserable. absolutely insane. I look down, and the ushers have, like, disappeared oh. by this point. And so, again, I'm just like, I do not have the capacity to, like, yell at some little kids right now. I'm just going to keep watching the goddamn movie. It's loud enough. I don't really care. Wait about 20 minutes, and they're still chatting. Like, they've been chatting throughout the entire movie, but it's just getting louder and louder. And finally... The real goddamn hero of the Batman movie, by the way, is not Batman. It's the bald middle-aged dude who is sitting next to me, right? Because he stands up and he walks over to these kids and just in the most, like, calm voice. I cannot believe he had any amount of patience to do this. He's just like, guys, come on. Can you, uh, like, keep it down? This isn't the time for chatting or taking pictures. Just please just calm down, okay? And then he goes back and sits in his chair and I'm just thinking, like, what a goddamn hero. <laughs> but, of no. course... These are kids. So they ain't gonna listen to some bald middle-aged dude. They're just gonna keep Oops. on talking. So they keep on talking and talking and talking. And I see another goddamn flash. Like, absolutely not an accident. There's no way this could possibly be an accident at this point. They are taking flash photos in the darkest movie theater while the darkest movie that has ever been made is playing on the screen. For everybody to just go blind at the movie theater, this guy stands up and he Same walks guy? over. He's like, you guys need to fucking put the shit away or I'm going to get an usher. And he sits back down <laughs> and just silence. Just total silence, just peace and quiet for like a good 15, 20 minutes. And at this point, okay, like at this point, Something happens that, for some reason, pisses me off more than anything that has happened so far. Because, while these kids have been incredibly annoying the whole movie, I didn't really understand their motivations until we get it's to like this point. like the fucking Joker, you don't understand their motivations. I, I don't understand their motivations until this point, because at this point, there is still an hour left of the movie, right? We're on, like, the last act of the movie. Things are starting to really heat up. And those kids stand up and walk out of the movie theater, and they never come back. <laughs> They're like, our job here, we got... It's like... <laughs> they were like freelancers hired to take pictures of a very specific thing. And they were like, our job here is like, done. What? <laughs> like, why the fuck did you buy movie tickets for a nighttime showing for a dark-ass movie, to come in here, to talk and take pictures and be annoying, and not even watch the movie. Like, they were just there for a hangout spot. I mean, honestly, it kind of sounds like the Turning Red kids. God, you know, it you might as well that, be. But, you know, it makes sense, because Priya was reading a Twilight book in the movie, meaning she's 33 in 2022 and would love a Robert Pattinson Batman. Yeah. Oh, probably, yeah. Oh my god. So was it the same guy who told them off twice? Right. Yeah, yeah, it's the same same middle-aged hero. I salute him. It's fantastic. <laughs> when I saw Old in a movie theater, um there was a there were these like shitty kids in the front and 
no one was like gave them any you know any sense of uh like oh we'll just let them you know we'll wait for them to talk as soon as they were talking when the movie starts someone in the back row just screams shut the <laughs> fuck up <laughs> and i and that is what i call a chad that's a chad that's a chad i'm so move. used to instantly shutting down children doing anything they're not supposed to that now even when i'm not working at school i just like have zero tolerance for that kind of thing so like no uh, i and it's not even that like i snap into a mode where i, I it's like my brain it's like a, i briefly think i'm teaching but one day i was just at the grocery store and two boys of like 14 or so were fucking around they were just like chasing each other and i just like, without even thinking about it, I just gave them a teacher look, and they stopped. <laughs> and then they, like, walk away. And I'm like, oh god, I don't... It was like a werewolf. I was like, I don't know what just came over me. I'm not even working right now. <laughs> Dude, I could, I could never be a teacher, because I cannot deal with kids. I just cannot do anything to them. I don't, I don't want to deal with There's that. There's a certain... You know? Hey, I mean, you and me both, and I'm doing teaching right now <laughs> there's a certain finesse to like walk knowing when to like picking your battles and knowing when to call administration just to save your own sanity i did have a meltdown this week it was really ugly you don't want to i'm never proud of myself when i reach that point but sometimes it's gotta yes we do what fucking happened yeah, yeah, it was just like i they have their own laptops and you know it's three o'clock. We get out at three fifteen. I'm out of things to do, and when and they they have this. It's like guys, you can play one of your educational games. All right, keep it an educational one. And they have a game called Nitro Type, where you type words that you're prompted, and it makes like a race car go faster, and you're in a race. And that I count that as educational. It's practicing your typing speed, and it's just you know how kids yeah. are. They just like love to scream, like. And these kids, they each have their own laptop, and when they lose at Nitro Type, they'll, like, punch the laptop screen. They get so fucking... <laughs> oh, Jesus. How many broken laptops oh, have you had? It's, and they owe, and they only have to pay $50 <laughs> to replace them, so... And, yeah, um... Wow. And eventually, it was like, I'm trying to... I'm like, you know, I'm doing all the tired teacher tricks to get their attention. If you can hear me, clap once! And one kid is... <laughs> oh, for God's sake. And just, they're still so into Nitro type. Three of them scream at once, and the combination of my stress level and the octave and cacophony of their screaming feels like two power drills in each of my ears, and they meet in the middle. <laughs> and I just, like, lost. I just, it was like a tea kettle. I was just like, stop! I, like. Was it like that scene from Kindergarten Cop where he goes, no, shut and, and up! I picture, my, like, I picture myself as Sully when he um, does the scare, the, the roar that scares Boo. I was like, enough all... <laughs> and like, the, sweet, the sweetest girl in my class looks like she's about to... Who's not doing anything wrong. Sees me hit this level and like looks like she's... A, she doesn't cry. She looks bat, like genuinely distressed that I've been pushed to my limit. And I just very meekly go, I'm, I'm sorry you had to see that. Guys, clean up. Let's go. <laughs> this week is over. Jeez. I do not, I do not really... hit that. You guys have to understand, I do not hit that octave often. And I'm not proud of myself when I do. But when it's like towards... Yeah, you'd think they like beat you at Smash or something. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy, can I share the, the story of... Um... Of when we were doing the Iron Man challenge. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't have to if you the don't. Thing want is, me there's to. a few stories that that could be in. Um, you know what? Be my guest. Go ahead. Uh, so I remember when. So there's this thing called the Iron Man challenge in Super Smash Brothers, where it's one stock. One person starts on the top of the roster. The other starts at the bottom, and you go through the characters. If you win, you get to keep your character. If you lose, you have to move on. And so, you know, we were playing, and um, I, I, I don't say this to be mean, but I was a bit, I was more, I started at the beginning of the roster, and I was still high up. Tommy was, like, kind of moving towards the middle. And I remember I was playing as Ike. I can't remember who Tommy was playing as, but I was just, it was complete silence, and then all of a sudden, Tommy just screams, Oh, fuck! 
There are times <laughs> in the Iron Man where you know you're needling me, though. Like what do you mean? <laughs> there's one time you, you like stabbing him with a needle while you're playing. There's one time cheating. you beat me, and I was like clearly kind of frustrated. I was like, ah, shit. And then we get to the results, and you just a barely above a whisper point to the screen and go, oh, hey, look, zero to death. <laughs> Okay, that was in Smash, like, 4, I feel like. <laughs> and then there's, there was one time, you were, because you're really good with Ike, and you're, like, beating this, you're, like, annihilating me with him. And I go, ah, oh, stupid. And you go, what was that? I was like, I so stupid. And you're like, <laughs> were you going to say stupid swordsman? Like, you're egging me up. I don't remember oh, that. Oh, honey, you don't. <laughs> you can't attack Will's swordsman, man. It's coming right after his babies. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Although, funnily enough, my two least favorite Smash Bros... Or no, two of my least favorite Smash Bros. characters are swordsmen. I thought they were swordswomen. No, that's only... I mean, I guess Byleth is both. Yeah. So. Oh, boy. Uh. <laughs> anyway, rant over on those fucking kids at the fucking movie theater in Greeley, Colorado. Yeah, that that's, sounds uh, really annoying. <laughs> that's all I got to say on that, so I'll pass it on to uh, to Tommy. All right. So, you know, speaking of Will needling me, I feel like something we don't always capture, a dynamic that we don't always capture on this pod is... um. The fact that you two are genuinely mean to me sometimes when I <laughs> <laughs> over my taste and things. So I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is put out a roast that is that is gonna piss you guys off. <laughs> Just okay. to see if you can hit that point. I rented and didn't fucking like Shantae Half Genie Hero. Oh really? Yeah. And here's the thing. I wanted to like it because I actually think the level design and platforming feels good. I like the transformations. It's purely the format that put me in a bad mood when I when I played it because that is a platformer where you don't have a set number of lives. Game over every time you die and you have to sit through the same cutscene of the start of the level every fucking time you go back. And it's a, like, decently challenging game. I, um, there's the sand level where the sandstorm is constantly pushing you back. I see where they're coming from. Shantae has a life bar instead of a 1-2 HP deal. But before that level is a, like, 10 text block exchange of Shantae being like, Oh, look, we're here in the desert. And then the, like, fucking duplicate genie comes up and is like, Later, fuckers! And I'm like, and, um, is clearly Risky Boots. I, I don't know that for sure. I'm guessing that genie is, like, Risky Boots in disguise. And I had to tap through that exchange so many fucking times. I'm pretty just, sure you can skip that. I was hitting plus on my Switch for, like, start <laughs> and minus. I couldn't get it to happen. Weird. And I don't I do not mind being challenged. Crash Bandicoot and Cuphead are games I've beaten, died many, 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 many times in, and I love them. What pisses me off is when a game wastes my fucking time. To the point that when there's a pretty there's a pretty challenging sand pit level, the extra ten seconds it takes to walk through a corridor, trigger a cutscene where like a sandworm starts taking you gradually adds up to be way too fucking long. And even that, I could almost forgive. But I started to notice, after I died in that area enough times, in addition to sitting through a cutscene over and over, it started to push blocks for me that I had to push before. So it was adapting difficulty with no input from me. So you know... <laughs> Like the fucking Nabbit mode in those Mario games where it's like, do you want to do the Invincible mode? It was doing that to me with no input from me. And that pisses me off. Because I do not need a game to hold my fucking hand. I'll do a challenge over and over as many times as possible as long as you're not whisking me to a game over menu. Making me select continue. Making me sit through a cutscene every fucking time. 
Jesus, Tommy, is this your Joker moment? You sound so <laughs> legitimately mad. In fact, Tommy, are you finished? I mean, there's so much self-pity, Tommy. You, you sound like you're making an excuse for hating Shantae Hapchini Hero. <laughs> or what's, what's he go? I decide what games waste my time or not, just like you decide what's funny or not. So, let's make this an opportunity for actual discussion, though. Is Half Genie Hero, like, the norm, or is there a better Shantae game out there that I can get into? They Pirates only Curse get easier. Better. There's better ones? Pirate's Curse is, in my opinion, the best Shantae game. Mm-hmm. I heard seven... That's the one af after Half Genie, the first one that's, like, in a 2.5D? Uh, it's the one before Half Genie Hero, because Pirate's Curse is number three and Half Genie Hero is number four. Oh, oh, I got confused. I thought Tommy was playing Pirate's Curse. Pirate's no. Curse is even harder than Half Genie. It is, but uh, it's more fun in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I, that's my favorite Shantae game as well. Um, Half Genie was... I, oh, I, I don't want to needle you, Tommy, but I think that Half Genie Hero was pretty easy, personally. I, I, you know, Dav, you said it, not me, but I kind of thought the same. <laughs> you know what? Well, you were complaining to me. You were like, oh, I just can't beat the devil in Cuphead. And I was like, but I did. I, I beat and it that's the you. difference between you I and me. I beat it before <laughs> you, and you did even, you were like, I think I said something, I sent the picture of the devil beaten because I was so fucking happy about it. And I just, you know, kind of cheekily said bow to your sensei, like, wow, I got one up on Will. Your response was the word no. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't even, I like, intend to forget I couldn't get a the back for beating Cuphead, widely considered the Dark Souls of indie games. Here I am, fucking taunted for not putting up with Shantae's bullshit. Yeah, I'm sorry, Tommy. Yeah, that was really mean of me. <laughs> it wasn't that bad. It wasn't nearly as mean as... <laughs> Tommy's like, I remembered this for years. Oh, sorry I did that. Oh, no worries. It's what's, fine. What's genuinely mean is when I said, yeah, I might buy Pokemon Sword and Shield, and you like, what? <laughs> you were like, okay, Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> you were really pissed I made a choice with my own money. <laughs> I mean, gotta vote with your wallet, and... Uh... Uh. All right, so... What's the T on Seven Sirens? Because that's a port of like a phone game, right? Uh, what? Well, no, because uh, it was sort of de developed simultaneously, and they just put it on Apple Arcade first, I think, because of some business deal. Is it good? Yeah, I think. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was asking, just is it good? It's the easiest one. I, just... I haven't I, beat I think... it yet, but it's pretty fun from what I've played. But yeah, it is really easy. Yeah, I think the one, like, th sad thing about Shantae games is they just kind of get progressively easier. Like, not just because you get good at them, j but just, like, because they're easier. I also think they really went in, like, far with the appeal of this game is sexy women. Do you still have the transformations in that one? Uh... I think so, yeah. Don't you? Yeah, you do. They're, uh... They're different. They're like, um, uh, there's like the drill squid. Hmm. Pirate's Curse, you don't have the transformations in, though. Oh. Yeah, but you get all the um, pirate's weapons, and that's really cool. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I don't mind if it's more challenging, just as long as it doesn't waste my time. I want to be able to die, hit a single button, and go back where the game wants me to. No, no, bull no bullshit. So that's kind of what it, I, I'll die as many times as I need to, as long as the game is economic about it. Well, if you want a nice, relaxing experience, might I recommend Elden Ring? Oh, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> I've never once been appealed to play a Souls game, because every time one comes out, everyone's like, this has risen my blood pressure to a deadly degree. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that'll about do it for me. Back to you, Will. Um, well, first of all, Dav, are you planning to talk a bit more about Elden Ring, or... I haven't played it yet, so no. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, because I couldn't get past the first level of, uh, Bloodborne, so I'm yeah. not sure I should get it. Um, anyways, uh, I think I will do another Toasty Toast, and toast Big Trouble in Little China, John Carpenter. Um, I watched it the first time with my dad. 
because my voice coach recommended it to me, and he said it is the most Kurt Russell Kurt Russell has ever been. Um, and I agree. And then I showed it to you guys, and I remembered just how fucking bonkers it is. <laughs> it's because it's the, it, the the cool thing about it is it's kind of a parody of like kung fu movies. Because like in this movie, like you know, in, in the the movies of old, it was always like. Oh, this, you know, one, this, it kind of like Kung Fury, like this one, you know, <laughs> random white guy comes out and becomes a savior. But the funny thing about this is that, you know, Kurt Russell's character is like this trucker who thinks he's an action hero, but absolutely sucks at everything. The idiot. That's the best part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, so like the, cause it's supposed to be like, oh, you know, this guy's got the, you know, Chinese sidekick, but it's completely reversed where it's like, that guy does all the work. Um, but also, it's, like, really funny. There's a scene where Kurt Russell goes into a brothel dressed like a total dweeb. Um, <laughs> for no real reason other than to just, like, be funny. And I think that's awesome. Um, but in addition to that, the action and effects are so good. Um, they, they're all practical. There's this really cool, like... Um, it's called the guardian, this like monster animatronic thing. Um, that's just really awesome. That sticks out in my head. Uh, there's like a giant fish in the middle of the movie. Um, <laughs> this is a guy who gets so angry. He explodes. <laughs> oh yeah. That part. <laughs> no, the dude who, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, <laughs> I guess that was also Tommy when I was, uh, beating him with ice. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, who's the guy who plays Lopan? I always forget um, his name, because he was in Turning Red, too. Yeah, uh, James Hong, I think. Yeah, James Hong, he's so good in this. I want to double check, because I'm <laughs> second-guessing myself. He's wonderful. I think he holds something like, yeah, James Hong. And I think he's something like holds the record for the most IMDb credits, because he's just rather old and has been acting, like, for so long that he's in so much stuff. Yeah. Oh man, yeah, he's really good. I, he just has that very distinct voice. Um, I always re uh, remember him as the restaurant host in Seinfeld, in maybe the best episode of that show, where for absolutely no reason he uh, George is waiting the whole time for a phone call while they're waiting for their table at a Chinese restaurant, and his name is George Costanza. They get the phone call, and James Hong just goes Cartwright, and hangs up the phone. And George is like, well, did you get a call? He's like, yeah, I called for you. I said Cartwright. <laughs> and <laughs> just for no reason, completely flubs his name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's he's just so good. You can tell he's having fun with it, too. Um, I think usually the sign of, like, a really good... Like, you know, there's a difference between, a like, a good villain because they're, like, written well and a good villain because they're just a fucking blast. And I feel like those two can exist together, and I think that's James Hong's character, Lopan. Um, I watched... Because uh, he's, uh, like... Uh, I was going to say, he's really intimidating, and he's cool, but also he's just fucking hilarious. I watched the Flash Gordon movie for the first time not long ago, and it's like, Ming and Lopan together are Shang Tsung, and Raiden also comes from this movie. All, but most of the oh, yeah, that's that, true. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, um I just think it's like a a ball and a half. It is so much fun. Something about uh the specificity of the fact that Jack Burton is a trucker just tickles me to no end. Cause that seems like precisely the occupation of a guy who thinks he's really, really tough, but there's no reason he'd have any skills to be of like any use to this mission. So of course he just kind of yeah, and he kind of is. And it's it's funny because he's like, there's a scene where he's like kind of working up the courage to like come out and uh, save save everyone. And he hops out and then it, his friend Wang just has already beaten everyone. <laughs> um, it's interesting. It's, I think this is one of Kurt Russell's best performances, but just because he seems so real. Oh, yeah. Like, um, there's just something about jack burton like all his because there's like a time where he calls someone on the phone and he's just so fucking irritated 
I just feel like Kurt Russell seamlessly blended into the character more than, uh, I, I guess I wouldn't say more than he has ever has because he's always great. But this is one of my favorite roles of his. Well, that's another thing I was going to mention, because um, I think you might be talking about the time when he's like getting on the phone with his insurance. And that's another funny thing about this movie is that pretty much this dude's entire motivation for like putting him, his life at risk is because he wants to get his truck back. And yeah. He doesn't want to deal with the insurance company. <laughs> it's basically like the whole thing. Yeah, I think I think that's a bit of a stroke of genius from John Carpenter because it's <laughs> it really frames about how much of a moron this guy is. That's like one of my favorite tropes is going into like the deadliest fucking thing for some. Like I think of Dudley in Street Fighter Three and how he's fighting these like Illuminati gods because he wants his vintage car back. <laughs> um, I think Russell was such a good choice too because there's so many action stars that could have been this. And they would not approach it with the same humor. I could see an alternate universe where this is Stallone or this is Mel Gibson, and they don't want to be the butt of the joke. But Russell is very game whenever he gets to be in action uh, in an action movie, and he's just very in on the joke, and he's utterly perfect for this for that reason. Yeah, and I know I don't know if they're friends or they just love working together, but Carpenter and Russell have worked on a lot of movies together. So they just blend so... They're they're kind of a dream team. They're probably my favorite, like, director-actor dream yeah. team. This is after they live, right? Um, I think so. This was, I think, after they live, before... The... Th I think it was after The Thing, too. The Thing? The Thing is Russell, too, right? Yeah, he's um the main character. Right, I always that. think of Keith David with that one. I you know because I don't know Keith David is like uh, the most badass cartoon ever came to life. He just has such a resonating voice. Yeah, yeah, oh, that's, a, that's not um, a good movie. Um, and he was also Snake Plissken in that's right. Escape from New York. I forgot. I forgot how many fucking Carpenters he was in. <laughs> yeah, and coincidentally, for those of you at home, Metal Gear Solid was heavily inspired by Escape from New York. So. If you love those games, thank uh, good old Kurt Russell. Yeah. And, um, oh, I don't know if I've told you this. In, it's an old game, so I don't care about spoiling it. You know how in Metal Gear 2, when Snake is undercover and he says his name is Iroquois Pliskin? Yeah. There, that's where it comes from, because Kurt Russell's character was Snake Pliskin. Right. Oh, right, right, yeah. Yeah, but, um... Davey, this was your first time seeing it, so what were your thoughts on it? I did indeed think it was bonkers. It's uh, it's really fun. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I don't really, I mean, it's kind of an interesting plot to try and follow along with because it, it really is, I mean, it's sort of better if you just watch it knowing that it's just nonsense oh, happening nice. chronologically. I almost, when I first watched it, I thought it was okay. This was my second viewing, and I liked it so much more when I was able to just surrender to what it was with no, without any, like, expectations throwing me one way or the other. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think this is a movie where you have to know, like, it's, it shouldn't be taken seriously. Like, it's equally an action movie as it is a comedy. Um, yeah, I know you saw it before this, Dav, but it's like Kung Fury, where it's really funny, but also <laughs> does have some genuinely great action scenes. Yeah. Uh, but that is all I have to say about the great Big Trouble in Little China. So over to you, Davey. Cool. So um, first toast is going to be for The Good Place. All right. Have you guys seen that before? Uh, I've seen clips I from it. I watched season one. What, you stopped at season one? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, it wasn't like an act. Well, basically. I didn't actively say, well, I'm not watching this anymore. I just kind of haven't gotten around to any more of it. I know. Just like the ending of season one without going into spoilers is just. I can't imagine like stopping after seeing that. But um, I mean, essentially, it's a show about uh, the afterlife. It's like a sort of a comedy drama film or series. I think it was on NBC or something. Mm -hmm. um, 
but it's a fairly recent. Uh, it basically starts off with uh, the main character, Eleanor, and she like wakes up and this guy tells her that basically she's uh, dead and she went to the good place and sort of in the lore here, there's the good place and the bad place and most people end up in the bad place, but she was uh, evidently good enough not to end up there. Um, but as he's sort of like talking her through uh, like how the place is and, and all the good things that she can experience there, um, she's starting to realize that there was like a mistake and she's not who they think she is. Because like, they say like, oh, you did this humanitarian stuff in Africa. And uh, she like, she's like, well, no, I didn't. I've lived in Arizona my entire life. But uh, she's keeping that a secret to herself because if she mentions it, then they'll probably send her to the bad place because she knows that's where she belongs. Mm-hmm. That's sort of the the hook of the show. Uh, there's a, a few other characters as well. There's um, like an, another character who ends up there, and they tell him he's like a Buddhist monk, but he's just like some guy from Miami. <laughs> so uh, is there ever like an in lore explanation as to why like I, I, it's probably God? God is making these fuck ups. Um, there is an explanation. Uh, that comes, I think. I would say the end of season mm-hmm. one that explains it pretty well. Because yeah. uh, the end of season one has like this just major, like earth shattering plot twist that basically, I don't know. I like, like I said, I don't know how Tommy could stop there, man. Cause that's, that's such a, like, I did not want to stop watching the show after I saw that. Cause that's like, Oh, that's what this, this show is going to be like. This is the, the type of writing they're going for. Cause it, it like, it starts off sort of almost as like any generic NBC comedy. Like you, you think you're just watching like a sort of a feel good, funny, ha ha show. But like as it goes on, it gets more like philosophical, and they they really go into like is this system like even like right that we have a good place and a bad place, and what can we do about this? And and I, like if I if I talk about it too much, I'm gonna get into spoilers because like the it's a four season show and the last three seasons are all just fantastic going off of that plot twist. Okay, so I I got curious and I I messaged Tommy and I was like, okay, what's the plot twist? Because I don't know if we'll ever get around to it. Mm-hmm. That plot twist is a beat for that. That is a ab. That is I'm trying to think of how to word this. Because I don't know if it's like a complete ripoff, but that is exactly what happens in an episode of The Twilight Zone. I wouldn't be surprised if, like, they built this series off of an episode of The Twilight Zone. I, I could totally see that happening. But uh, they really flesh it out, honestly. The the concept is really well done. Um, and what, what's really great about it is that uh, it, it never feels like there's any filler or time wasted. Like, every single episode counts for something. Mm. And it's definitely condensed. And season four, like the end of that is the end of the show. And it's like a very good ending that wraps things up. Would you say that it ends in a good place? Yeah, yeah, I would. <laughs> uh, where can you watch satisfying. it? Uh, Netflix. Oh, may as well uh, uh, pick that up since I'm... I just got done with a uh, arcane, which was that. Did you toast that in the the, the long lost episode? No, yet? that was in one we posted. Okay. Um, aside, I, I agree that it's a, a really quality piece of animation. Yeah. yeah it's where great. I where I am with the good place is that like I think it's an impeccably well cast show. Like I love Ted Danson in it. He's so good. I like Kristen Bell, yeah. Jamila Jamil. Everybody's really good in it. I find the humor a little twee. Like. I do not need a whole show where people go, what the shirt? Because you can't swear in this dimension. Um, yeah, I, I don't think the comedy is the strongest part of the show. I think it where it really shines is where it, when it goes into like the philosophy concepts and into like the world building and, and fleshing out what's going on. And, and honestly, also the character writing is just really good. So I, I wouldn't watch it if you're looking for like a laugh out loud funny show because it's it's not super funny and it uh i mean it doesn't always try too hard to be it does have those sort of dumb jokes but um i i I can't really fault it too much for that when everything else is so good um one truly funny thing i think it did was um 
What's the name of the woman who's like an AI? Uh, Janet, Janet, when they're like trying to turn her off, and she's like, "Be warned, I have. I'm not a. Re- I'm not a living creature, but I will react like one when you try to turn me off." And they like reach for an off button, and she's like, "No, I don't want to die." <laughs> <laughs> That is, that is uh, pretty great every time they try to shut her down. She has the cactus bit, too. She's actually pretty unabashedly hilarious. Maybe I should give that show another shot. She is great. I and mean, uh, I do think that the show gets funnier later on. Right. Um, Because I do think a lot of the comedy in the first season is also deceptive. Um, Because it is trying to make you think it's not the type of show it's going for. Mm after that plot twist. So they, they do go for like some more like lighthearted, I guess, lame comedy is a, a way to put it. When it was like 50 billion jokes about frozen yogurt, I got that impression. <laughs> it's a little like, all right, yeah. <laughs> but maybe I should give it another shot. Yeah, you might talk me into it. Highly, highly recommend it. It's such a good show. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and this was a rewatch. Cause I watched it for the first time last year and I just rewatched it again, like last month and just loved it still. So the entire thing. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Uh, mind if I take the wheel? All right. Yeah. That's all, all I right. Got. Um, I watched, I have a, this is a toast with a huge, huge asterisk that has me on something of a journey of looking deep within myself. Um, I watched the film Chuck Steele, Night of the Trampires. This is a British movie I've been waiting a super, super long time for. It made its rounds at film festivals in 2018 and was in British theaters last October and just found a distributor to put it on rental services here in the U.S. I first found the preview short of the character, like, October 2020. So I've been waiting a year and a half to just watch this full-length movie. And when you're waiting that long, sometimes your expectations can really work against you. And so what really draws me in is this is a claymation lampoon of 80s action. This is a character to the effect of Lethal Weapon, Jack Burton, relevantly enough, um... Rambo, all those guys in claymation that like looks like um, Will Vinton, the the uh, Mark Twain claymation cartoons, and that is like just such a cool thing to me. I love clay, I love claymation, especially that very chunky, uh, older school aesthetic. I love eighties action. I was so so excited for this movie, and I think in some aspects it works really well, but there's some parts that. I was not crazy about, and I had a bit of a crisis as to if that only disappointed me more because I've been waiting so long, or if it actually kind of sucks, and because I've been waiting so long, I want to like it more than I do. Their eyes, if I'm being too cautious, but I did not sit well with the fact that the police chief started to gradually wear women's clothing the more he spoke to the therapist, the gag being... Oh, all this therapy is gonna turn up men into women. And they play this, like, angle that the therapy is bringing out a trans identity in the police chief. And it is played for a mean-spirited la- laugh more than once. And I... Is it, it's, is it like, it, it presents it as though the audience should feel that it's a bad yes. thing? Because it's like, well, that's the thing. That's the thing, is that it's also very, very clear that Chuck Steele has anger management issues. The thing is, he is like, he's like, I don't have anger management issues, and he's throwing a desk out the window. (laughs) And he's clear, it's clearly counterproductive to his mission. So, and, you know, they say, Chuck, your wife, uh, just because you lost your wife, anger isn't the only thing you need to feel. That's kind of what they're like. So it's like, Chuck needs to see therapy, and, you know, get his feelings out, but not so much that he becomes a namby-pamby girl about it. And it's very, you know, again, that piece where it's like, we're sitting smartly in the middle. That bothers me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, especially because, like, in, in, like, modern days, it's kind of especially that they're, we're trying to, like, destigmatize and be like, hey, you know, it's fine to go to therapy. People do it. Um... That's a bit of a bra moment. 
as an outsider. Yeah. And man, there's, there's things this movie does so well. Like, I'm trying to be, be fair that there's scenes that this movie really impressed me with. Um, there's a point you see at the very start that Chuck has all this angst because his wife was killed by ninjas. And you see that as a flashback at the very start of the film. Like, uh, this is maybe... I don't, I'm not too concerned about spoiling this movie. It's so, so niche. And I don't think it's necessarily plot heavy. You see a scene halfway through that that's a story he made up because his wife left him. Oh, shit. So, and that impacted me so hard. Because we have this sad, stuck-in-the-80s motherfucker who has to create this macho story for all his angst and all his anger. That really had an effect on me. And all the villains are laughing at him. It's genuinely a powerful moment. But all of its views on masculinity just contradict themselves in a way that kind of came back around to frustrate me as a viewer. Um, I ultimately walked. Try, I'm trying. I ultimately walked away feeling very positive because I think, if nothing else, if you can put the politics aside, the claymation is stunning. There are these. Huge set pieces where Chuck is fighting a horde of zombies in a circus, and it is lit exceptionally well. The kills are gory and cool. Something about claymation gore is awesome, because you can always just see these little shreds of bloody clay flesh <laughs> that I get a real kick out of. Um, it also lampoons 80s action really well. When he sees, it's like, the movie, one of the early gags is Chuck sees... Uh, a news piece he doesn't like and he shoots the tv then he opens a closet full of te broken tvs that were clearly shot and he just throws it in there <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking great um there's a running gag that he always has a partner who he takes on missions gives the same speech and stuff to and the partner always dies and uh -huh. they always the part, the part here's your new partner and the partner just gets increasingly uh absurd to the point that's like Detective Giggles, a chimpanzee, is following him around. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's very funny in that regard, but it is all... Uh, it is a confused but beautiful movie. I'm kind of glad it just exists because I think we need more claymation, especially that can be pretty... Especially in just a more sardonic, sardonic unscrupulous tone, because I feel like when something's claymation, it always has to be kind of artsy and twee and stuff like that i uh, i ultimately do like it i just wanna i think i think this would be irresponsible to recommend without being very clear the details i would give a benefit of the doubt to yeah it's a shame even peepa do does trans representation better <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> oh i still just slay the people do and deserve. I still fucking just find myself singing that all the time. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, take it from a cis straight white guy. I don't know if an 80s action parody has the best politics. <laughs> oh well. Well, over to you, bud. All right, uh, so this is a bit of a like later roast. I was talking about you with a bit, Tom, with it a bit, Tommy, oh. and I, it's just been on my mind. I'm going to roast WandaVision. Nice. Mm. Because when I first watched it, I really loved it. I'm like, this is great. Um, I've been thinking about WandaVision and because uh, the first time I saw it, I enjoyed it um, mm. because I'm like, yeah, I really like the, you know, genre jumpings, different, uh, you know, TV styles. I like the villains, but the more I marinated on it, I kind of think it's a bit of, like, a piece of shit. I agree. And here's why. It doesn't have a lot to offer outside of its initial premise. Yeah. Um, I feel like those are still cool, but in the greater scheme of things, it a lot of those, like, quote-unquote, it's been out for, like, a few, what, a year now? A year now, yeah. Yeah, so, like, a lot of the TV genre switching stuff, like, it's... A lot of them just exist to exist. Um, and also, I'm starting to have a real fucking problem with Wanda herself. 
not because of her as like a character, but because of the way that Marvel is like insistent on presenting her as this like victim. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. Uh-huh. Cause like um, at the, at the end of WandaVision, you know, it's revealed. Yeah. Wanda, you know, brainwashed an entire town, forced them to, you know, play out her fantasies to their will and then shoved away their children somewhere. So that's obviously, you know, not a good thing to do. That's what villains do. And it would be fine if, you know, Wanda's like, you know, oh my God, I, I did this and this is terrible. And on top of that, she kidnapped all the, their children and wouldn't let them see it because she was like, she wanted to have kids with vision. Mm -hmm. Which is a terrible fucking thing to do. But then Maria Rambo has to ruin it all by saying, they'll never know what you sacrificed. <laughs> Which is the <laughs> dumbest thing I've ever heard. Not to mention the, the new Doctor Strange movie is... Uh... She has that line in the trailer about... Um, yeah, see, that's that's what had me thinking about it, where she's like, you break the rules, you become a hero. I do it, and I become the villain. I don't think that's fair. It's like, yeah, Doctor Strange helped a fucking teenager who had his life ruined, and you kidnapped and tortured an entire town, you fucking idiot. Because you lost your boyfriend. Yeah. It's, kind of, it's the meme of the girl bleeding from her wrist. You'll never know what I've been through. And the guy with the fedora with knives all around his back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like, I, I feel like there's a contrast in what Wanda should be and what she is. Because Marvel is like setting her up as though like, oh my God, you know, poor her. She, she lost everything. But then the story is like, the story is like, you know, wow, she did this to a bunch of people and they're all, you know, they were all miserable. But then Wanda also, like, doesn't really feel bad about it. Yeah, she does. <laughs> she does seem to. I think there is there is a marketing thing where Marvel does not want any of its characters to be in the gray area. Um. So they really have to double down on either someone is all the way a hero so we can sell math folders with their faces on them or all the way a bad guy so they can die in one movie. And yeah. so they're, they just really got to double down on if we're going to address this, we're going to kind of hand wave a few things. And that's, I think, unfortunate. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they kind of did that with Thanos and... Uh... I don't know if you guys if you follow a YouTuber named uh, Unique Namasaurus, but he just put out a really good like video essay where he just like rewrites Thanos in Endgame, and I think it just came out way better. Yeah, I mean Infinity War. I can't believe people like Endgame more than Infinity War. I can't believe that either. Infinity War is so much better. Yeah. Um, well, and like the cool thing, I think you know, like what Tommy was saying, it Thanos is like a morally gray character. He's like, yeah, I'm doing some fucked up shit, but it's gonna help people. Yeah. Um, but like Wanda is like like she she clearly feels some shame about it cuz the people are looking at her wrong, but then she's like absolved of all guilt when Maria Rambo's like y you're good, you know. It you <laughs> fuck all these townspeople. You are designated hero of the show, you yeah. know. <laughs> no, and it's yeah. it's just it really like it really pisses me off that that's what they're going for because you can have a villain that's like i'm not doing anything wrong but wanda lets them go at the end so it's not like she's it's not like she's a full-on villain you know she's like okay fine you know i'm done but then it's mm -hmm. also like it's also like, oh, you know, never mind. I was the good guy the whole time. You know, fuck, fuck them kids. Yeah, it's like anybody else. If it was anybody else, I feel like usually when they write somebody else in a similar situation, by the end of whatever they're doing, it's like a lesson learned. Like, oh, uh, this I can't do this. It's not justified just because I've suffered before. But with her, it's like, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you, you're okay to, we're going to forgive you for this because you suffered... As much as everybody else, if not less so, for some yeah, reason. Yeah, no, cause, like, in the show, you can see that, like, when they when they get their minds back, they're like, 
let me go. I'm fucking miserable. Please, like, I'll do anything. Some old lady's like, please let us die, or something. It's like, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, like, I don't know how they're trying to spin that of, like, Wanda. Because, like, it, it sucks that... No, it, it doesn't even suck. She made up her kids. They're not fucking real. Yeah. Because it's like, like, there's that scene where she, like, bids them farewell, but it doesn't really hold any weight when you know that she kidnapped everyone else's kids just because she was jealous. And, like, you take, you look at a show like Hawkeye, which is all about dealing with Clint's guilt over what he did when he was Ronin during that gap there, and I think there's things wrong with how they handle that. They do not present Clint as a guy who's like, well, I didn't fucking do anything wrong. I was in a bad place. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. He, ha- he he has like a sense of accountability that makes sense for a human being. Whereas, you know, ostensibly from the glimpses we have of Multiverse of Madness, Wanda almost comes off as a child. Like, yeah, she's I mean? like, she's throwing a temper tantrum. Yeah. Well, and it's like, I, I think it's fine if they're going, like, if they were going for Wanda is a villain, it would be fine if she's like, you know what, I, if, you know, I'd kidnapped a thousand children before I let this, you know, fantasy die. And she's had that history in the comics and in the MCU even, come to think of it, when she was kind of working for Strucker, it wouldn't be completely out of left field. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's just... A load of, pardon my French, crap. <laughs> I, um, I'm reluctant to, like, throw it away, like, say, I don't like WandaVision anymore the way you firmly placed yourself, because I'm always bellyaching that Marvel shit is the same, and an, an, a morally great anti-hero character doing extensive genre lampoon to what I think is still a, at least an aesthetic quality and is pretty creepy here and there, is what I've been asking for for a while, and I have fond memories of watching that show. I do completely agree it is such a shame that it has all this baggage. Yeah, and there, I, I think this is setting up Wanda to be, like, a shitty character. Mm. I, to be honest, I've always thought she's kind of a shitty character. I've never really liked her just because her power levels are so inconsistent, it seems. Um, but... Anyways, that's my problem with WandaVision, and I am... Sam Raimi's one of my favorite directors, so I have become from optimistic to cautiously optimistic for Multiverse of Madness. Back to you, baby. Okay. Um, Let's see, what do I have on the docket? Uh... Well, I recently finished Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. All right. And, that and was, is it a toast or a roast? That's a toast. It's very good. Yeah, it's is this, uh, this is the most recent one, right? Uh, yeah, it's the most recent, like, single-player Star Wars, uh, like, action game. Um, but it's a... Basically, it's a Souls-like. So it, it it takes a lot of concepts from like Dark Souls. So you got uh something like similar to the bonfires, which is like meditation circles. Um, the enemies are for the most part pretty hard. Uh, but unlike Dark Souls, this has like a difficulty slider. Technically, um, it it doesn't necessarily make uh the enemies like more powerful per se, but it adjusts things like parry timing. So I think that's a pretty smart implementation. And, uh, you know, obviously with the release of Elden Ring, a lot of people are saying, like, Dark Souls games shouldn't have difficulty and it, it would be impossible to implement. But I think this game does a really good job of uh, balancing that out. But um, the sort of the where it, it stands in the story is it's, I think, five years after Episode 3. And uh, the main character... Uh, was a youngling who escaped uh, from Order 66 and was sort of hiding as a... working as, like, a scrapper on some planet. And uh, he got basically found out by the uh, Inquisitors, and they're hunting him down. Mm -hmm. The Inquisitors are always so fucking cool. I'm glad they're being utilized more. Yeah, they're 
pretty dang cool, and uh, they're the boss fights with them are really sick, honestly. Um, is it like the the is is it the same Grand Inquisitor that we keep seeing, or is it like other Inquisitors? Uh, it's other ones. I think they're like original to the game. Yeah, fair enough. Um, but anyways, go ahead. Yeah. Um. Honestly, just a really fun game. It it sort of takes uh, some concepts from, like, if you've ever played The Force Unleashed, it has mm-hmm. some similar gameplay to that, but I think it's a lot more refined. The combat just feels fantastic. There's, I, never, uh, I never made it far in The Force Unleashed, but maybe a top 100 uh, video game memory is the prologue where you're Darth Vader on Kashyyyk and just sending... Uh, Wookiees hurtling through the fucking air. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the fucking best. That is something that I think is so fun about The Force Unleashed, though, is you, you get to be just this evil dude and just wreak havoc. It's fantastic. Is it, is it like a um, a game where you can choose your morality, good or bad? No, it's uh, it, it's very clearly... Because um, it's not... I wouldn't even really say it's a role-playing game. It's really just taken uh, the, the role of somebody who because sort of the the main intention is that they're trying to uh revive the jedi order so it's him and like a crew of a a couple other people um what's interesting about the game is that there are a lot of callbacks to the the clone wars series like they go to um i think dathomir which is where the uh the witches are that uh ventress came from oh shit really yeah they do a lot with that there's a some main characters there uh honestly i think a couple of the planets are from clone wars um so if you, i mean if you've seen that series you'll you'll get a lot out of this too uh the story is pretty good for the most part um i feel like it's a little short but they they are they do have sequels planned and uh one of my i guess really one of my only complaints as far as the gameplay goes is you kind of unlock things throughout the game. So, like, for, for example, you don't even get force pull until, like, you only have, like, 25% of the game left. Oh. But uh, it, it does encourage, like, revisiting planets to get all the collectibles, and um, it, it's pretty open-ended for the most part. But uh, overall, just a really fun time. The puzzles are pretty good. Um yeah, and the main character is uh, interesting, but I think they really need to do more with him in the sequel because I am um, personally getting kind of annoyed with how many Jedi they're writing into the story as having escaped Order 66. Order 66 I, I did not do its job properly. <laughs> no, like at this point we have so many characters who just walked away from that somehow, and it's kind of getting a little sketch, but uh, you know, I can suspend my disbelief enough to enjoy the game. Um, and is this like a brand new game? Because I know they always do remakes of like Knights of the Old Republic and this and that. Is this like a whole new thing? Yeah, it's, uh, it came out uh, like the end of 2019. It was a brand new IP, and so they're doing more with that now i see well i like the sound of um going to different planets because i like a star wars property that embraces and indulges the fact that george lucas drew some goofy looking aliens and they're putting them in deadly situations yeah it sounds like i can i like yeah i like the sound of going back to the witches ventress kicks ass um (laughs) excuse me um do we get any other like is there any other Leo DiCaprio pointing to the screen. All right, if if it's not a spoiler, is there any other like big ones we might recognize? Um, uh, let me think, because there is a pretty big spoiler one. Um, God, I feel like yeah, the spoiler is that somehow Palpatine returns. <laughs> <laughs> uh, honestly, not really that much. It does a pretty good job of being like self-contained and just introducing new characters that you're interested in like the um not like the final final boss but um one of the last guys you fight uh on dathomir is just so interesting and cool Mm -hmm. they don't do too much with him but um he's a really interesting character i think sounds pretty neat 
All right, yeah, I mean, I've always wanted it. to try a new Star Wars game, so may have this to pick this one up. Definitely one to try. So, yeah, cool. All right. Um, I wonder if that's the one. Hmm. I don't know. That that has nothing to do with. And if I take the last one, sure. All right. Yeah, and you guys are. Uh, we've been going on for a while. You guys are cool with news after this? Yeah, yeah let's I'm do good. It. All right. Well, uh, I'd like to toast Garo, Mark of the Wolves. Um, this is an SNK fighting game, which I'm super, super into at the moment, because I also bought and have been thoroughly enjoying King of Fighters 15, which is a great, great game, but one that I see lots of opportunities to talk to in my uh, other videos coming up. So I'm going to set that aside for now. You'll hear all I have to say about it. But it's got me on a real SNK kick, and I found that PS PlayStation Now, or Plus... Whichever one has Garo, Mark of the Wolves, too. This is, um, this is the finale of the Final Fight series. So, which is the origin of Terry, who is one of many characters who spun off into King of Fighters, which has become its whole gargantuan thing. It's the story of Terry Bogard becoming stepdad to the son of the villain he sent hurtling off a building. It is a 2D fighter, one-on-one, -on -one, not the triple teams things like King of Fighters, and it fucking rules. I, I hear there was a sequel planned, but for some reason it never happened. I'm willing to wager it's because there was brand recognition difficulties, and no one was really sure what Gero, Mark of the Wolves, was, because it's not the title isn't connected to King of Fighters or Final Fight, and even Terry looks pretty You mean different. Fatal Fury? Fatal Fury, sorry, the F, 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 I always get him confused. And even Terry is redesigned kind of drastically to look a bit older with his bomber jacket. So I all, uh, I love that it took those swings, because it's a cool fucking game with a cool fucking universe. Um, well, what do you think of uh, brown bomber jacket Terry, before I keep moving? Because you're very fond of Terry Bogard. Yeah, I mean, I nothing's going to beat, you know, the classic... Classic buff, um, buff Pokemon trainer, Terry. Yeah, well, I just, I love, I really love that fucking hat. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I'd also be lying if I said it wasn't a good design. I think it really fits an older Terry. Um, yeah. You know, and like, he's he's got to step up because I think that's a really good touchstone that he's like, you know, this guy killed my dad, and I killed this kid's dad, so I'm going to make up for it. <laughs> hey, sorry, kid. You want a licorice whip? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, their their relationship is very touching. Um, we're getting a T.O. DLC in King of Fighters 15, which is Rock, E. Janae, who is waifu, 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 and the best fighter in the game, fucking Gato. He is this Chinese Kenpo dude who is like, if Ryu from Street Fighter was a fucking asshole. And I love him because he's a wandering warrior just like Ryu where his whole deal is, I gotta keep testing my martial arts, I gotta keep fighting. But the difference is, he has a family at home he's neglecting to go get in kung fu fights. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> there, and it's not played as like a tragic, it's literally like he's an addict and his sister finds him and is like, Dad and I need you to come home. And he's like, no, I'm fighting. Fuck you. <laughs> it's the, he's awesome. Um, and it's one of those things where you get such an emotional attachment to a character. This game is a tough ass boss. It's not casual. And just, I had a spare 30 minutes before work the other morning. I was like, I'll squeeze in some Garo. I roll through his Gato the first time I try him. No continues. Stomp the boss and the secret boss. It's the kind of thing that just makes gives a character a special place in your heart. That's like, he's the one who clicks with me, and I fucking dominated the game at long last with him. Oh, man. Um, this game's, you know, it, it's... I was telling you, it is stiff on the level an NRS game is. Like, you'll feel like, why am I so constricted? Because the whole point is that the character sprites are huge and you're right up in each other's faces. It's about reading counters and fighting right back. There's projectiles, but it, like, the neutral square button punch hits like a ton of fucking bricks because it is all about blocking and countering at the best possible moment. And I think those, I haven't even had this game for that long 
it is so exceptionally satisfying that way. Uh, I think it is excellent. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so is it like, is it like, uh, kind of like Mortal Kombat in that it's, it's also like pretty like the combos as well. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I've seen some next level combos that are fucking, uh, Gato, the character I mentioned has a bicycle kick, but it goes kind of diagonal. And if you time it just enough, you can keep kicking them into the corner of the, the top corner of the fucking screen and just keep lifting them into the air with a long enough combo. Oh yeah. That does sound really cool. Yeah. Um, it's so full of atmosphere too. Like, King of Fighters, one thing that's, like, kind of barred me from it from a long time, but I'm starting to come around to, is that there's always a fuck ton of characters. Because you're building a team of three, and everyone has two teammates. And I was like, do I have to know all these fucking backstories? And you kind of come around to learning, well, I don't need to know everyone's backstory. It's, I know what this team is doing, and it's really one fully fleshed out character and their two friends. They may, you know, there's one person really centrally motivated. Garo is so fucking good at fleshing out its characters. There's B. Janae. She's the super hot pirate chick I talked about. She is, she's like, you know, leader of a pirate crew. And she's always followed by just an army of pirate simps. And they just, like, her intro animation is they all have like a glass of champagne, throw the glass down, and the mob of pirates moves out of the way for her to fight. It's wonderful. Um, there's... There's a guy, there's a character who's a caricature of a real-life martial artist, and his name in Japan was too close to that martial artist's name. So for some reason, his American name is Kushwood Butt. And his stage is like just a little log cabin he seems to have built himself, where he spars with a bear who wears a gi, because he just kicks fucking ass. It's shit like that I love. It's an awesome game. I think... It wouldn't surprise me if it kind of fall, fell by the wayside because Fatal Fury is considered kind of a secondary fighting game franchise, and this is a weird finale spinoff to that that doesn't even have the same title. I think everyone should give it a go. I genuinely think it's a fighting masterpiece. It's a new favorite of mine. And this is the second one? The second what? The second Gero, you said? No, no. It's, it, we, it went Final Fight 1, lots of Final Fights games, Gero, Mark of the Wolves. That's it. Okay, gotcha. I didn't want to. I wanted to make sure I didn't miss you. It's, this is the one and only game called Garo, and I think it's roughly considered a final fight game. Ah, oh, crap! Fatal Fury. Yeah, you're about to get fucking copyright infringed for that. Yeah. All right, we're ready for news dockets. Let's do it. All right. Uh, first order of business. Lots of delays. Advanced Wars is delayed, and uh, I don't know if I can think of why. Do you guys know why that might be? You know why? I think it's because um, they really want to make room for the Shamrock Shake at McDonald's. They want it to have its time. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, that's. I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing else going on. I mean, all right, let's. Uh, I'm not going to make light of that any longer than I have to. No one wants to. No one in. No one really wants to play a game with tanks right now. Reasonably so. Yeah. No. Absolutely. <laughs> it, it's reasonable. We don't want to play a game. Where it is a cartoony version of something horrible happening some uh, somewhere. Speaking of delays, just about every DC movie this year has been delayed, and I can't really figure. I genuinely can't really figure out why on this one. Do you know when they've been delayed to? Um, Super Pets got pushed like a month to July, and Black Adam is now in October, and Flash, and was it Aquaman two that we were supposed to get? Are yeah. next year now. Oh, gee, that is a while. Do you think it has something to do with those leaks and they saw the backlash and want to do reshoots? I don't think so. Warner Bros. is so, so high up its ass. I think they just double down on it and call anyone who didn't like it sexist. Mm. Eh, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I hope it's not because, well... I hope Black Adam is good. I hope that's not, like, getting weighed down by the Rock's ego or anything. Because I have kind of, against my way better judgment, totally. I'm going to look like a total jackass. I have pretty high hopes for that one. Well, Black Adam's one of my favorite DC villains. And the Rock has said, he was like, 
if I this is the part I was born to play. Mm. So he clearly has a lot of just like heart in it. So I feel like he's working hard to make this good. Jared Leto sure did too. He, uh, yeah, that's fair. But The Rock is like, I, I trust The Rock. I would like, yeah, he's he's much more of a trustworthy gentleman. Um, but no, I mean, Jared Leto put in work because he's like he wanted to be this oh crazy character. But I don't think Jared Leto is actually a DC fan. You know. Mm-hmm. I feel like The Rock is actually a fan of the character Black Adam. I just don't want them to soften Black Adam. I want him to fucking kill a superhero. That's oh, all yeah. I ask for. I don't want them to make it... He can be relatively sympathetic. Black Adam has some, like, human qualities to him. I want him to... I don't want the Adam star quality to make them afraid to have him fucking t- scratch Cyclone off the census or Adam Smasher. Well, they've said, he said, like, The Rock has been pitching this phrase for a while. Mm. The power of the DC universe is about to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe it's my anti-hero fatigue, too, because I don't want this to be a Venom thing, for heaven's sake. No fucking way. Yeah. The fact that he's opposite, like, four superheroes gives me a better feeling. I hope we just get, like, the fucking hardened supervillain thing we're looking for. I don't know. We'll see. Um... Alright, uh, oh, um, we got an announcement for Street Fighter 6, and no one's really happy about it. Yeah, pretty much, everyone's like, this logo sucks, this trailer kinda sucks, and it kinda does. Oh yeah, well the logo absolutely looks like it took all of two seconds to make. Well, I think people- Because they, they, they took it from a stock image, didn't they? Yeah. I, I, I think so, yeah. Um, man, this is the kind of thing, you know- my one upside, I'm glad it's sexy Ryu seems to be the default now, because I think they want to do that in Street Fighter V, and I've been bored of underbred Gi Ryu for a long time. The fact that we're getting bearded Mountain Man Ryu seemingly as, like, the, the Ryu we're getting makes me kind of happy. That said, I'm not, I'm not thrilled with the direction it seems to be taking. I hope this is, uh, like... People, and I'm parroting people I admire when I say this, but the tone of 4 and 5 has been, if you're not Ryu or Chun-Li or Bison or the main villain, then you're doing just goofy shit for this game. It's, your story of this game is, "Uh uh-oh, where'd my bike go? Time to uh, meet this character and have a misunderstanding with them. I hope that changes for this one. That's not not entirely true, because, like, Charlie and Rashid were really involved in Street Fighter V's story. They were good in that one. I'll eat crow on that. Yeah. I just, you know, are we going to do something kind of cool with Vega or Balrog for once besides, well, I guess I have a kid now. I don't know. Yeah. Um, The big thing, I'm because, like, Number one, it's odd that they just announce it and they're like, you'll have to wait till summer Ow. to hear anything. Um, it's the trend I, lately. Yeah. Um, I also, I, I would hope that Capcom has learned its lesson and releases the game when it's full, uh. not like wait a year to even like, you know, get the story mode. I don't see them learning their lesson, frankly. Yeah, I don't know why that is with like, At least we're out of the woods of how anti-consumer Capcom was in, like, the 2010s of time to buy Ultimate Marvel again because you're not upgrading this shit, you know? Oh, yeah. I I don't know if it's Japanese shareholders or Japanese, like, customers, but I I think that maybe they just aren't as open to change and they kind of just want to stick with what worked once and then just always do that. That does make sense, because if you notice in, like, Mortal Kombat, in an Injustice, in every game, a character has a different super. Oh, absolutely. But in Street Fighter, Ryu's had Shinku Hadoken since the first, uh, from Street Fighter 2. Like, that's Probably. always been his thing. And again, I'm parroting other people I've been listening to talk about this. Like, I was just talking about SNK and King of Fighters. Those characters develop quite significantly, not necessarily all of them, but if you look at the history of how much Terry has changed, or Iori, or Cronin, they've gone through a lot of developments and have really changed how they work, whereas we've been playing as Guile wearing a dumb military suit and doing Sonic Boom 
over and fucking over. Yeah, it's been... Well, and, and the other thing is, the Street... I don't know why this is. I'd like to hear your take on this. Street Fighter is so scared to go past three in the timeline. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why. Well, the original Street Fighter 3, when it first came out, was considered something of a bust. Like, kind of a failure. And that's an end point story-wise for so many characters that I don't... Because the whole... It was like the... A big reason for that was you get Ryu and you get Ken and no one else you really recognize. And I was, they were like, oh, but if we go past that point, we have to do that again. And we fucked it. Third Strike, when they updated to Third Strike, is one of the most cherished fighting games ever. It, it took a long time to get to that point. Vanilla Street Fighter 3, for all of the beautiful things about it, in my opinion, was considered kind of a fuck up. And I don't think... They want to leave that comfort zone, which means not going past the time that point in the timeline. That makes sense. I mean, I would like my ideal is I'd like cool characters to come back, like especially G. Everyone fucking loved uh, G like in I Street Fighter ass, Five. Yeah. Um, but like I do like to see the you know the classics, like you know Ryu Ken, you know the World Warriors. Um, but at the same time. I don't know how to feel about Luke. I I think a UFC fighter is borderline an essential addition to Street Fighter because that's probably the biggest martial art in the world at the moment. But there's aspects of him that feel like almost a retread of Ken. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it was Maximilian that said if Luke wasn't in Street Fighter Five. When Luke appeared in the trailer, everyone would be like, what happened to Ken? Yeah, you're exactly right, actually. That's exactly true. No, I just think, I mean, right now, they're just hyping up Luke as, like, he's the chosen one. But they're, like, I've seen the Street Fighter V story of him. He's not really an interesting character. Mm, I have to check that out still. And, yeah, he's just kind of like, you know... Oh boy, look at how, you know, he he's kind of like, I guess, a Terry-like personality, but without any of the depth. Yeah. Well, like, we've spent, we, they spent all of three hyping up Alex to be that game's hero, and go through the trouble of bringing him back in five, why not have this be the big Ryu versus Alex Super Bowl? Yeah, I mean, I think, and like, people love Alex. Cool. he's awesome. But people... I think it's not a good idea to make Luke the protagonist without, like, treading the waters. Mm-hmm. And, and I think, like, I know, I know you like Mortal Kombat X a lot, and I'm not dunking on it, but I know a lot of people had problems with the severe whiplash of this is a new cast of characters mm-hmm. and they're the heroes. That is something, and that's something King of Fighters deals with, with the new hero team, and that's something I actually want to explore in a video is new generation fighting characters and the trends they follow. So you're absolutely onto something there. Yeah. I just think that if you, if you just kind of push certain characters forward at the expense of other characters immediately, mm-hmm. it's going to end up hurting them. Like, you know, uh, I guess that's like, I'm trying to think of it in comic terms. I guess that's like if Batman was just completely replaced with Batgirl. Mm-hmm. Which, judging by the leaks, seems like it's going to happen. And keyword being immediately, because I feel like I blinked and Street Fighter V just ended and we're already moving on to six. No. Nope. Yeah, and they need like a significant, it's not going to be like, it's not going to look like the cutscene we mm-hmm. saw. But they need a significant upgrade because as much as I liked, I loved the, some of the redesigns and I loved the V triggers and V skills in five, but the graphics do look very like, kind of like claymation. Uh huh. Yeah. I'm ready for that. Like very puffy, like all the characters look like blue. I'm trying to put it into, they look like, this is a balloon animal of Ryu I'm playing as almost. Yeah, I'm ready for that like kind of Popeye arm aesthetic to go away. I'm ready for something else. Yeah, uh, Davy, as someone who's I don't think you've ever played a Street Fighter game, what do you think of this? Um, I like the beard. 
it is a pretty sick beard. For you, uses yeah. Manscaped. Uh, and speaking of installments coming way too fast, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet is announced. This is such a terrible idea. I'm like, listen, <laughs> I'm loyalist to a fault to Pokemon. I feel like they're doing their thing. They're a construction crew that's doing their thing. And people are like, we want things to change. And they're like, oh, can't hear over the jackhammers. What? We've already got two new buildings ready. <laughs> Yeah. You know, um, to be fair, it looks a lot better graphically than Sword and Shield, but yeah, I'm still not really... I don't have high hopes for it. I think it looks better graphically as far as the Pokemon go. Those are the dumbest looking protagonists ever. Like, not the, just in yeah. Pokemon, in... I, I'm gonna... You know what? It's a, it's a stretch. I'm gonna make this claim. Those are the worst designed, like, blank slate protagonists ever. I don't... I bet we're going to be able to customize them, maybe, hopefully. <laughs> I think so, but customization, like, the cool thing about Pokemon is the protagonists lo looked like they could kind of be any young uh -huh. age, but these just look like fucking middle schoolers, and I don't, like, <laughs> even middle schoolers don't want to play as middle like schoolers, They should have, like, a know? giant lollipop and, like, a sailor ribbon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm a little obsessed with Fue Coco. I never make a judgment on starters until I see the final evolutions after what happened with um, Poplio. <laughs> uh, um, I'll never forget seeing Rowlet for the first time and just having my whole world rocked. They've never topped that one, in my opinion. Um, I'm a... Uh, I mean, I'm obviously a, a septile guy. Um, I just... I mean, the thing about Pokemon is it's going to sell anyway. Yeah. I don't think, like, you know, this, the, the, you know, Pokemon games sometimes barely have any story. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they don't really have good graphics yeah. either. So I don't really like, uh, like the thing with um, Sword and Shield that especially made me not buy it is that there were only like two Pokemon that I actually liked. They've lost a bit of their touch. The Legends Arceus Pokemon are not... It's not a great set of new ones. I don't love them. No, and it pisses me off. I, 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 I know you were probably, like, thinking about hmm. this. They made a fucking Dragonsteel pseudo-legendary, and it's Gudra. That pisses me off. I had no one. idea that was Dragonsteel. I hadn't heard. Yeah, it's just because of that stupid fucking wow. shell. It's Dragonsteel I had no now. clue. Everyone's like everyone's like, oh, you can't have Dragon Steel. It's too powerful. And then they make a pseudo-legendary and it's fucking Gudra, the dumbest pseudo-legendary ever. Uh, my, my thoughts are with you. I mean, just sounds uh, condescending because I haven't hopped on Legends Arceus yet. It's just, for some reason, it's been a tough sell for me. Maybe because I, you know, everyone in the Pokemon community is rallying for change and this is what they wanted to see. I'm a little like, this is kind of scary. This sounds like a bit much and it doesn't even look that good to me. Yeah, I mean, everyone's like, the gameplay is fun. But again, like, on a console that runs Breath of the Wild, graphics are a selling point, especially yeah. for a company, like, not just Nintendo, but Game Freak, that makes so much fucking mm -hmm. money. Like, put a little work into it, guys. Don't just, like, vomit out stuff. But Witcher 3 runs on the Switch. Yeah, like, yeah not so even there's, a no, there's no excuse. Even, you know, even if not um, necessarily the graphics themselves are great, I still... Sword and Shield has a lot of colors, and the UI is very appealing to me. Legends Arceus always looks like I'm, like, fighting a Snorlax in the mud. You know? <laughs> like... The thing about Legend Arceus is I've heard, like, from Pokemon fans that everyone loves it, but I've never heard anything about the story or, like, the gameplay. I just see people, like, throwing balls at yeah. Pokemon. Oh, well, I mean, it's in my Gamefly queue. It'll have its day in court with me at some point. For so I just have... I'm dreading that I'll either not like it or I'll like it more than I expect and need to carve out a ton of time for it. <laughs> it's this weird uh -huh. self-defeating complex I mean, I'm having with it. <laughs> so here's... um. Here's my question. Dav, you're the least Pokemon... Kind of like Street Fighter. You're the least, you know, Pokemon fan out of all of us. What are you thinking? 
Um, I don't think this game is going to get me back into Pokemon. Like, uh, I've said it before, Sword and Shield made me realize I'm not... Uh, Pokemon just is not for me. Um, but what usually makes me, like, interested in Pokemon games and what usually draws me to those is, like, the character designs. Because they, they're usually very good oh, about yeah. that. Like, Sword and Shield had some really well-designed characters, but this one just looks so uninspired. Mm -hmm. It's just really dull. Like, I get they're going for, like, a, a Spain setting, but they... I don't know. It, it doesn't feel like they've ever been shackled by, like, what do grade schoolers look like in this region? Mm -hmm. Th they can usually go pretty wild with it and still have, like, interesting designs, but this one just isn't doing it. Yeah, I mean, the every Pokemon protagonist, even if I haven't loved it, has at least looked mm -hmm. cool. That's a selling point. And even if, like, okay, let's pretend the audience are, you know, middle schoolers. Or even little kids. If you're playing Pokemon, you're looking for either cute or cool, and these protagonists look neither. They look fucking stupid. Yeah. And everyone on, everyone on Twitter is like, Oh, you know, stop being stop being mean to it. You know, they're supposed to be 12 and they look 12. Isn't that good? And it's like, you know, that's that's valid. You know, they're supposed to be 12 and they look 12, it, but that doesn't explain why they look like fucking You don't need morons. to look like they're going to go sing how much for that puppy in the window. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I'm sure next time we record, there's going to be some kind of she has a new hat moment where I'm like, I'm all in. I get to feed my Pokemon candy now. But for now... I'm only cautiously optimistic. I guess we'll see how it goes. Well, yeah. Fair enough. I guess I'll do it for this month's West Coast Toast and Roast. But, um, unfortunately, we can't use this recording because teenagers were setting out flash photography in my apartment the whole time. Uh, bruh. Get out of here, kids.